Hi and welcome. This is Boston Media Theory. I'm Marcus Breen and this is a program where we talk to people who are living in and around Boston and in this case tonight visiting Boston for the long term. We'll get to that in a minute. Who uh, And people who are engaged in research, uh, consulting, activism, around and in the fields of media and communication. Certainly uh, the majority of our guests are academics but certainly as keen watchers will know we're not restricted to the academy in our investigation of media and communication. So tonight I'm delighted to welcome Victor Pickard from the Annenberg School and you can tell us more about that school if you like Victor and uh, what it, what it, where it is really. I think there's two of them where you are based and what it's about. That's right. Uh, it's the Annenberg School for Communication that I'm based at is at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the other one is at uh, USC, uh, University of Southern California. Um, we sometimes refer to them as the other Annenberg, and I'm sure they say the same thing about us, although we were founded first. Uh, but um, yeah, there's, it's I think, similar in the sense that um, we're both uh, composed of uh, a range of qualitative and quantitative uh, media and communication scholars. Okay, and the Annenberg name, we should clarify that refers to a real person? That's right, Walter Annenberg, uh, go the, the, he founded uh, the, the schools and uh, we have a bust of, of him actually when you walk into our building. We honor Walter Annenberg and, and continue uh, to respect his, his legacy uh, and his, his family's legacy in, in supporting the schools. Very good. I'm sure he's uh, more respected than uh, either, is it John Harvard over there in Harvard Yard who, who has very shiny brass boots because people lean against him and have their photographs oh, right. taken <laughs> with him. And then at Northeastern there's a wolf. Uh, and people put uh, their hands on the wolf's snout and it has a very shiny golden snout. Oh, uh, interesting. But anyway, I'm sure uh, <laughs> Annenberg bust doesn't uh, have the shiny bits. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to talk about media and communication, particularly media as it relates to public policy. Uh, I think it's fair to say that that's your specialization and uh, an important field in which we are, like many other things in the media and communication space at the moment in the United States, uh, uh, seeing, well, I, I'm reluctant to use the word extraordinary, but really is an extraordinary amount of change mm -hmm. in relation to the way the federal government, maybe less so state governments, and you could comment on that, but certainly the way the federal government is engaged in changing the nature of whatever might have been a playing field around how media is structured and organized and therefore regulated. That's right. There's a, a dangerous misnomer being thrown around right now that this is some kind of deregulatory project that we're seeing. That, um, for example, Aji Pai, who's now the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, which of course is the regulatory agency that oversees much of our media system in the United States, uh, he's currently throwing out a lot of uh, regulations, and this is being described as deregulation, when in fact it's really a kind of re-regulation. I mean, we're seeing uh, the rules being rewritten in ways that will favor corporate interests over what you might call the public interest. And uh, so I think that's a very important way that we should be framing this. This mm -hmm. isn't simply taking government out of our media system. It's actually inserting government into our media system, changing it in ways that then benefit particular industries. So, the, so what you're saying is that this re-regulation is offering a different set of opportunities for the structure of the industry itself. Yes, I think that's an accurate way of, of uh, phrasing it and describing it. I, in many ways, what you're seeing is uh, removing particular safeguards that, for example, might prevent particular um, media monopolies or oligopolies from forming. Um, and also, I'm sure we'll get into this more in our discussion this evening, but um, net neutrality is, uh, is, is something that's being, um, it's on the verge of being thrown out as well. And again, that really isn't a form of deregulation. That's, that's re-regulating the internet so that internet service providers have more control over what we can do, what we can see, what, what we can access online. Hmm. Let me back up a little bit and ask, because it's often useful to get a sense of a person's history and what led you to research. I mean, wh wh why media and regulation? How did you fall into or were led into this field? Right, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's often um, 
people may be puzzled when they hear, you know, why, why would one be interested in media policy? But I didn't start there. I started with a very broad question, which is what is the role or what should be the role of media in a democratic society? And from there, I asked the question, how did we in the United States come to inherit a particular kind of media system? What sort of decisions led to this kind of media system? Why didn't we have a different kind of media system? And these questions eventually led me to policy questions. And instead of thinking of policy as some wonky thing that some people uh, decide far away, we really should think of it in terms of a social contract. I mean, this is how we design our media is a major social issue, a social problem, and therefore it's a policy problem, and, and this is where we decide what is the relationship between government, the public, and media institutions. That's really, in a nutshell, what media policy is about. And so that's why I'm, I'm drawn to, the, whether I want to be or not, I'm drawn to those questions. Right, and what about this question, which always fascinates me in relation to media and regulation and public policy, this idea of the public interest? Right, it's an inherently contentious idea. Um, and of course, we really should be thinking of not just one monolithic public, there are always multiple publics, but if you look at the history of the idea, at least implicitly, there was an assumption that the market could not provide for all of our communication needs. That there were certain informational necessities that we had to create a separate category called the public interest that we had to make sure was being served. And it was often, at least implicitly assumed that, that commercial media systems could not satisfy the, the breadth of, of, of those qualities that, that the public interest requires. So I think that's an important way of, of framing it. There's been an ahistorical argument that it's all that this idea of the public interest has always been vague and abstract and we've just never decided, we could just never figure out what it actually means. But in fact, historically, there have been moments where as a society and at the Federal Communications Commission in particular, they've really tried to put flesh on those bones. They've tried to really quantify what, what counts as the public interest. They've tried to present criteria to uh, really concretize what is the public interest. And every time this happens, industry interests have intervened to make sure that that doesn't happen, or if it, it does happen only in very weak, um, ineffectual ways. Mm. Um, and therefore, we're left with this idea that there's just no such thing as, as the public interest, or it's just a vague idea, yes. ideal. Yes, uh, not least of which is, of course, this somewhat perverse, but cur uh, and also curious idea of what the public is interested in. That's right. A and that's a, that's a, a sort of tragic slippery slope <laughs> that's right. to go down in because at certain points we'd all be, all be interested in, I don't know, uh, soap opera or on t TV or some other kind of crazy popular, poor populist. Right, right. It does slip into these commercial uh, values and sometimes the distinction is also made between, you know, what, is the c what does the public want versus what does the public need. And this does w open the door for charges of, of elitism and paternalism. I mean, who decides what the public interest is? But ideally, it's a it's a it's a conversation between um, regulators uh, in, in in regulatory bodies. Uh, but local communities should be determining um, what what they need. And if you s if they step back, and it's not just about you know what sort of entertainment do you want to see in your media. But if you also ask, you know, what kind of information do people need from their media? Um, what sort of views and voices do they want to hear? Because oftentimes, if we just leave it up to the market, it's only it's going to leave out a lot of views and voices that that are important to have a democratic uh, debate. So I think when you get local communities involved, you get closer to that ideal of of the public interest in, instead of or as opposed to s leaving it up to the market to decide. Right, which raises two points in my mind, one of which, of course, is public broadcasting, which we can talk about in a minute. Being Australian, I'm familiar with and grew up almost exclusively with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation mm -hmm. and have a richer life as a result. I'll go out on a limb and say that. That's <laughs> and good I don't to hear. Doubt it, yes. uh, uh, but then there's the other side of it, and that is what happens in that situation where, okay, we might think of the community being able to make choices and make decisions, 
where there are people who perhaps don't have the capacity to participate mm -hmm. or the assumptions associated with the idea of a community being every fully representative. Mm -hmm. what, hap what happens then? Uh, that's a really good question and, and, and there's not an easy answer to that. It's always going to be somewhat fraught um, in, in trying to make sure that all views are included, that all voices are included. Um, but I think there are principles that can be established and I think uh, in many public broadcasting systems around the world in many leading democratic societies they've they've been able to do this where they uh, mandate that particular minority voices get uh, you know get representation in in within the media system um, and we used to have things like that here in the United States most of them have been thrown out um, especially in the 1980s uh, during the the Reagan administration um, but that I think that's something that, that that's possible. We've we've wrestled with this before. It's always going going to be a tension, um, but it's not insurmountable. Which of course leads me nicely to public broadcasting mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, what's called the Reithian model, named mm -hmm. after John Reith and mm -hmm. the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation model, a, a kind of high high culture kind of notion, mm -hmm. uh, somewhat patronising and yet uh, quite remarkable in the way in which it structured the idea of a United Kingdom mm -hmm. where everybody would be pretty much guaranteed to have some sort of representation and or participation in the media space of the early days of television and radio. Mm -hmm. uh, quite remarkable in, in its difference to the United, Nates, the United States which, which really has been how to maximise private interests as opposed to public or non-commercial interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, th that's that's true, and, and I think when you start looking at the comparative histories, there's actually some interesting uh, connections here. You mentioned Lord Reith uh, in in the early days of the BBC. Uh, you had uh, this gentleman. Uh, I've done a, a fair amount of research on Charles Seatman, who was one of the original uh, programming directors at the BBC, and he clashed with with Reith in the early days about extending the BBC's. Uh, uh, representation to include the region so that oh it wasn't really? so London focused. Um, then he left the United Kingdom, came to the United States, became a naturalized U.S. citizen, and was actually the primary author of the FCC Blue Book, oh. uh, which is one of these earlier moments where mm. the FCC tried to define what is the public interest, what do commercial broadcasters owe the public in return for their many benefits that are given to them, like monopolistic control of the public airwaves um, and not to leave your viewers in suspense. It was not successful, <laughs> but I think it serves as an interesting high watermark for where progressive policymaking tried to create this very strong, robust public interest principle for broadcasters. Right. Now, you mentioned the FCC. So the, the key regulator in the United States for media and communication industries, I think, is the Federal Communication Commission. Is that right? That is correct, yes. I mean, some things also fall under the purview of the FTC and the Department of Justice, um, and of course Congress and, and you know, other governmental entities, bodies have uh, control, uh, have influence over how our, our uh, media system is designed. But for our telecommunications systems, our broadcasting systems, and other key systems, the FCC is the main regulatory body yes, for those right. decisions. And then, of course, what happened with the 19... And, and so it, it really operates as a result of Telecommunication Acts, right, or Act. Yeah, right. well, and that's where Congress is intervening and passing laws yeah. that then can dictate what the FCC can do. Right, yeah. so the 1996 Telecommunication Act, of course, was the moment where the Congress said the law is now going to be that we're not going to have the sort of regulation that we've had that would guarantee a national telecommunication system. Mm -hmm. And the industry, and particularly the computer industry, said, well, that's fine because we we don't have regulations <laughs> anyway. Thank right. you very much. Uh, as they say in England, I think it's thank you very much, Mrs. Jones, for the rabbits. You know, this is <laughs> yeah. a free gift. And and uh, look, at the, look at the consequences. Some very, very vast uh, fortunes have been generated mm -hmm. as a result of that absence of regulation, mm -hmm. both at a financial or uh, economic level, but also at a social level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big changes. Uh, what, what's what's the FCC up to? What, what's it, what what should it be doing, given this particular moment? Mm -hmm. Now we're in December 2017. Mm -hmm. We're seeing 
uh, I don't know, what, what do you call it, maybe a crisis in the, even the very idea of public regulation uh, and, re or, and or regulation particularly intended to benefit corporations. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what are we to make of all this? Do you, do you have a, a sense of how, how yeah. we should think about this? Well, it's Please. <laughs> yes, I, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a lot happening. Uh, a lot has happened in a very short period of time. We've heard, although I think this narrative is going to start shifting, especially after the, if the tax bill goes through, but we keep hearing about how Donald Trump's agenda has largely been stymied, that it's, you know, he hasn't been able to um, push forward the, the, the big plans that he, that he initially had hoped for. However, at the FCC, his agenda has been pushing forward uh, quite rapidly through uh, the vehicle or through the person of uh, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai. And uh, in a very short period of time, we've seen a number of dramatic changes. So going back to your two questions, what is the FCC up to? What should the FCC be up to? Two very different okay. questions. Um, start with what they're up to. Just in recent weeks, they've uh, thrown out key media ownership um, rules, one in particular, the uh, cross-ownership ban, uh, which had been put in place in the 1970s that prevented one uh, media corporation from controlling uh, newspapers, radio stations, and the major TV station in, in one market. So try to create uh, what Europeans call media pluralism, we sometimes call media diversity, but based on the assumption that one media corporation should not control all of the community's uh, media, that this is a dangerous situation for a democratic society. So he threw that out. Um, he also um, announced that he uh, intends to throw out net neutrality. Now that decision will be made on December 14th. Net neutrality is this basic safeguard that prevents internet service providers like Comcast or Verizon from interfering with your online content, from slowing down or blocking particular kinds of content, or for, from creating um, fast lanes and slow lanes, sometimes referred to as a tiered internet. This is another key public interest protection um, that he r plans to throw out. Um, there have been a lot of other things that he's done. I think those are a couple of the big ones. Um, another big thing that's going through is the Sinclair uh, Time uh, uh, Tribune um, uh, uh, merger, mm -hmm. which uh, would lead to a massive uh, conglomerate. Sinclair is already already owns uh, mo more uh, TV stations than any other corporation in, in the country. Um, so this is another key area where things are changing. Mm -hmm. um, it, going to the question of what should they be doing, um, I think when we look at how many Americans still do not have access to broadband internet. Uh, many Americans lack uh, access to quality, reliable news. Ideally, the FCC would be doing things to try to help that situation. Sure, and it's unlikely that they will, do you think? There's been no evidence that they, w that they are really uh, trying to do that. In fact, another one of the key decisions they've made is to, to uh, dismantle um, this Lifeline um, uh, program, uh, which basically tried to subsidize low-income Americans to have access to, to broadband, basically giving them cheap broadband services, and that's something that looks like it's, it's being thrown out. So, uh, so no, if anything, this FCC is doing the opposite of, of that, of trying to get more people uh, having access to news and information. It's pretty serious, and it really brings back into the calculation of public policy that term the, uh, was it the, um, where people, uh, the digital divide, is that the one? You know, where people just don't have access to digital information. That's right. They Sounds don't like have access to the fundamental material that helps them live their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. When you hear the phrase digital divide, that sounds like something from the 1990s. Yeah. But in fact, it's very much a problem today. Different uh, calculations will give you slightly different numbers, but I think you, it's safe to say roughly that about a fifth of American households do not have access to wireline broadband internet. Um, and this is a major, major problem. When you think about how it's no longer uh, a luxury, the internet is a necessity for everything, including education, health, livelihood, just news and, and mm. information. Mm. Um, le forget about entertainment. I mean, that's part of the mix as well. But just things that we need for our material uh, life, day in and day out, we require access to to fast and reliable internet. And right now, m many Americans do not have that. 
I can tell you uh, in more concrete terms that here in Boston, a young African-American uh, student told me that in parts of Dorchester, Verizon refused to offer its high-speed internet facility called Fios to that neighbourhood because they didn't believe that people would be able to afford it, so they just decided not to not to provide it. Mm -hmm. So th that was just a simple local example mm -hmm. of uh, where perhaps the, you know the high high quality broadband was just left off the calculation of what would be offered as a service. Yeah, and another phrase you sometimes hear is digital redlining, and that's yep. the notion where internet service providers, and it's, and it's rational from a, a market point of view, it's entirely rational that they would focus on profitable uh, uh, consumer, you know, profitable markets. So low income communities, rural communities, it's expensive to build out their system to, um, unless they're required to do it by policy, by public policy, it's not rational from an economic point of view for them to try to s prov give services to these communities. So that's where there needs, again, this idea of a social contract. There needs mm -hmm. to be, that's the role for policy to mandate that they do that. They're getting, their monopolies are gi getting tremendous benefits from society. What do they owe society in return? And their answer presumably is nothing. Right. Well, I mean, it, they would never say that. That would be bad PR. But uh, they would, you know, describe it as, uh, you know, efficiencies and 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 what makes economic sense. Or they'll say um, that they are doing this in in various ways. That they are providing this great service, which they are. But they're not not to everyone. You know, they you know, not to the people who can't afford it. You've used uh, a wonderful term, an evocative term, in some of your writing which I want to discuss in the last seven or eight minutes, and that is this corporate libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to firstly attempt to provide us with a, a definition mm -hmm. of corporate libertarianism, and then perhaps we can talk a little bit about some more of the uh, issues around giving over particular kinds of power and uh, responsibility to corporations mm -hmm against what we might think of as a, as a public media system. So let's start with mm. corporate libertarianism. Sure, it, it's, a, it's a term uh, that, that I uh, use to try to describe a ideological project. Uh, and I locate it historically in the 1940s, but there's, in the United States, there's evidence for it beforehand and it, it has a long history since then. But I see in the 1940s, these arguments really start to crystallize where media corporations in particular see themselves as individuals who are protected by a First Amendment right. And it's also based on this assumption that the, mar that the government should never be involved in markets generally, but media markets in particular. Um, and so to, to extend this a little bit, any, any, uh, any effort on the part of the FCC to try to rein in commercial excesses and corporate power could be um, attacked as a socialistic um, intervention that this infringed upon the corporation's First Amendment rights. So they were able to use the First Amendment. They essentially captured the First Amendment to use it as a shield against any sort of public interest um, intervention. And uh, this is based on a number of fallacies. I think we've already hinted at, at these earlier. But one is this idea that the government should not be involved in media markets. The government is always involved in media markets. The question is, how should the government be involved? And if you just think of things such as, again, these media ownership uh, rules and regulations, um, uh, spectrum management, I mean, the fact that these broadcasters are using the public airwaves, copyright. That's a form mm. of government regulation. Corporations often think of it as a good regulation, but that's very much, that, that entails government being involved in, in many different ways. So again, it comes back to this social contract question. If we <coughs> concede from the beginning that government will always be involved, then it's a question for all of us as a society to determine how should it be involved. And under corporate libertarianism, it's only the corporations who are making that decision. Right, it, re it reminds me a little bit of the the idea of the kind of corporation as being the only real uh, measure and mm -hmm. the only real standard by which a society is considered. That's kind right. of Margaret Thatcherist, Thatcher, kind of Thatcherist 
yeah. view. There is no society. No, it's just individuals. Uh, right. Just individuals. Yeah. yeah. And and the the sort of negative nature of that being, as you suggested before, if you don't take some kind of make some sort of sort of calculation about the fact that there's a lot of people who rely who or who just cannot operate in the market mm -hmm. because of poverty or because of whatever other issues there might be all of a sudden you, you, you don't have anything that might approximate a society that's right. because the media is the only way that people find out what's happening in society. That's right. It's, yeah. a, it's a curious but important set of principles here. It is, and, and I think historically it's been impoverished in the U.S., but it wasn't always this way. I mean, when I look back in the 1940s, 1930s, there was a stronger sense of these collective rights that we as a public, we as a society should have, and that should include access, a right of access to again, quality news and, and information, mm. and that has been um, largely pushed to, to the margins. And what we have today, a concept that I use a lot in my own work, is this idea of regulatory capture, um, where the regulatory bodies, such as the FCC, comes to internalize the logics and the values of the industries that it purportedly regulates. So in many ways right now, it's almost as if the FCC is providing customer service for these industries instead of regulating them in the name of a, in the name of a robust public interest principle. Um, and that's, that's the scenario that we're faced with today, unfortunately. I remember the first time I heard the phrase regulatory capture uh, was from my uh, dear friend and mentor, uh, William Melody, many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think he picked it up when he worked with Dallas Smythe at the FCC. That's <laughs> even right. more years ago. Uh, important principles. Yes, and Dallas Smythe, I'm glad you mentioned him, uh, he was the first uh, chief economist at the FCC. He was there during these 1940s debates that, mm -hmm. I, that I write about in my work. And um, he was eventually pushed out of D.C. Uh, during this period of red baiting. He was one of these people, he was just trying to do public interest regulation, but they accused him of being a socialist, and so he, as many radicals do, he fled to the academy. Um, and found, it was actually my alma mater at the Institute of uh, Communication Research, University of Illinois, but he was one of the founders of the public, uh, of the political economy tradition of communication research, which is sort of the, the lineage that I, that I draw from. Right, which is where you and I met. That's <laughs> right, that's right. Uh, thankfully, wonderfully. In the last minute or so, I'm wondering if you'd like to say uh, quickly, uh, what should we do? about these uh, questions of regulatory capture, the FCC problems yeah. and so on. Yes, the question, what's to be done? I think it starts with this sort of, at the discursive level, that we're you know, at the level of conversation, how we're framing this de these debates and, and, and making sure that we're not talking about just deregulation, but it's re-regulation and there needs to be a social contract. But once we move beyond the level of, of academics talking about these things, I think we have to really try to translate it to broader publics. We need to make sure that people understand that these changes, for example, if they were to lose net neutrality, that's going to affect their daily lives in very detrimental ways. So to get the public to engage uh, with these sometimes wonky policy issues is key. And old fashioned picking up the phone and calling uh, your, your representative in Congress is always important, but also forming activist groups. Uh, the, the slogan that you often hear is that whatever your main issue is, media reform needs to be your second issue because mm -hmm. your first political issue is not going to get very far unless you have a media system that allows your voice and your, your political issue to, to advance. So I think we need to convey that to, to the public. Okay, Victor, well, thank you very much. It's been great to have you here Thanks tonight. for having me. I've okay. enjoyed the conversation. All right, indeed. And that's all from us and from me for this version of Boston Media Theory. Uh, until next time from me, Marcus Breen, uh, please keep on metering and then see you later. Welcome to understood.org, a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and expert advice.